of the apostles. The community of believers was of one heart and mind, and no one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they had everything in common. With great power, the apostles bore witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great favor was accorded them all. There was no needy person among them, for those who owned property or houses would sell them, bring the proceeds of the sale, and put them at the feet of the apostles, and they were distributed to each according to need. Thus, Joseph, also named by the apostles Barnabas, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite, a Cypriot by birth, sold a piece of property that he owned, then brought the money and put it at the feet of the apostles. Verbum Domini. The Lord is king. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is king. He is robed in majesty. <clears throat> the Lord is king in splendor robed. Robed is the Lord and girt about with strength. And he has made the world firm, not to be moved. Your throne stands firm from of old. From everlasting you are, O Lord. The Lord is king. He is robed in majesty. Your decrees are worthy of trust indeed. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, for length of days. Dominus Fobiscum, et cum Spiritus Tuum, Lexio Sancti Evangelis Secundum Ioannem, Gloria Ti, Domine. Jesus said to Nicodemus, You must be born from above. The wind blows where it wills, and you can hear the sound it makes, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can this happen? Jesus answered and said to him, You are the teacher of Israel, and you do not understand this? Amen, amen, I say to you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But you people do not accept our testimony. If I tell you about earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has gone up to heaven except the one who has come down from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Verbum Domini.
In the 19th century, it was popular among British and German artists to depict Revelations chapter 3, verse 20, where Jesus said, here I stand at the door and knock. And whoever hears my voice and opens the door, I will enter and have sup supper with him and he with me. One of the most famous of those paintings is by William Holman Hunt, a British artist who painted it actually three times. One is called The Light of the World. One is in a chapel at Oxford University. The last one he painted at St. Paul's Cathedral in London. The one I have here is one that was in our own home on the Iowa farm, painted by an American from Chicago and his name is Warner Salmon. He died in 1968. He painted the head of Christ, which was his most popular painting, and over 500 million copies were made of that. This was his second most popular image. Again, we had it in our own home. I remember looking at it many times at our own home when I was growing up. And it depicts Jesus, who is knocking at the door, but there's some interesting features I just learned about last night as I was uh, reading about this painting. And so Jesus is in human garb, and he said in today's gospel from John chapter 3, no one's ever gone up to heaven except the one who's come down from heaven, the Son of Man. So he became a Son of Man coming from heaven. He's in human garb. But in that darkness that fills that painting, you also see there's thistles growing up. These thistles, I remember on the farm, you know, that they come to this huge head, seed pod, and they're just this thorny mess. And so you see this, this huge overgrowth of thistles that is there, you see the darkness, and even in the grill on the door, there's darkness inside. And yet there's a light emanating from this visitor who's knocking on the door from Christ. But this is an interesting feature about this painting is that if you look next to Jesus' hand, his right hand, which is about to knock on the door, there's a shadow that's cast on that door. And what is the shape of that shadow? It's a heart. So there's a heart shape there. So the door represents our own hearts. And that door has no door latch, it has no door handle on the outside. It can only be opened from the inside. But that one, there's hope because that one who is looking out from the inside through that grill and it's filled with darkness in there, he looks out and there's this light. And he sees the goodness, the goodwill on the face of this visitor. And so he's prompted to open that door. So what this illustrates as well is the gift of faith. So it's God's initiative. Faith is always God's initiative. It's his gift. Faith is a gift. And it's necessary for us to receive God's grace to respond to this gift, this invitation that God is giving to us to respond to him. And so it is a gift, the Catechism number 153 speaks about this. Faith is a gift, it's infused, but before this faith can be exercised, there has to be this grace that's moving and assisting us. And it speaks too of the interior helps of the Holy Spirit. And what does the Holy Spirit do when we're being invited to respond to Christ who's knocking on the door of our hearts? The Catechism says the Holy Spirit's moving our hearts, converting us to God, opening the eyes of our minds, making it easy for us to accept and believe the truth. 
So again, it's his initiative. It's something that's infused. Grace has to move us, and our hearts are moved. Our minds begin to see. And it becomes easy to accept this invitation. Because just like this person who would be in this dark place, this dark house, that he sees the benevolence of the visitor, he sees that light, and there's a misery that comes from that darkness, from that overgrowth, which represents, you know, sin and lukewarmness, this revelation chapter 3, verse 20, is actually right after the Lord's words to Laodicea, which had grown lukewarm. And it's like, a return, it's like an invitation to return to the Lord with all of their hearts. You've lost your first love, we heard in today's first reading at the divine office to the church in Ephesus. I have this against you. you you've lost your early love. So it's like this call to return. And isn't this time when there is a certain isolation, there is this certain darkness hanging over all of us, that we look to Christ, we look to him, to open the doors of our hearts to him. And so there are many ways that we can do this, that we can open the doors of our hearts. You know, in today's first reading from the Acts of the Apostles, it's a continuation of what we heard yesterday from Acts chapter four. It's a continuation of Acts chapter four today. And if you remember yesterday that Peter and John had endured this, this persecution by the leaders, and they come back and they are telling the other believers, they said, well, this is just like Psalm two had prophesied that the leaders would, would um, as they quoted it, let me read the actual passage from the kings of the earth rise up, the princes conspire against, against the Lord and his anointed. So I said, this is really foreseen in Psalm 2. But then it says that they prayed, and they prayed that the Lord would move with power and to continue to work these mighty signs. And it says the place shook, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. So that Holy Spirit that prompts us to live more fully that life of Christ to which we are invited. And one of those that was moved by the Holy Spirit was Barnabas in today's reading. He was called the son of encouragement. His, his given name was Joseph, but the apostles named him Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. And what we see is that Barnabas responded with his whole heart. So this was his response to the Lord's invitation, to the Holy Spirit's prompting, moving his heart, opening his eyes, making it easy for him to respond. And he couldn't give anything but all. <laughs> he had to give it all. And so he sold everything that he had. He laid it at the feet of the apostles. And we see in the Acts of the Apostles, that he was this man of great generosity who would encourage the faithful, who helped Mark, his cousin, and who was so helpful also to Paul and, and to the early church. You know, I was, yesterday, as uh, Father John Paul mentioned, was Mother Angelica's birthday. She would have been 97. And so I decided I would send an email to all of our employees throughout the world. And in that, I said, you know, Mother, she was inspired, she was moved, she was prompted, she was inspired to begin this great work. But that she always saw it as his network, God's network. And I said, she believed in you. She believed in you, that God too would inspire you, that if he called you here to work here, that he would inspire you, he'd, he'd, teach you, he would show you, he would guide you to help this work to flourish. Because Mother, of course, couldn't have accomplished it just on her own without help that the Lord would call others. So it took generosity on Mother's part to respond to this invitation. It took generosity from all of those who've come here to work here. It took generosity from 
our viewers because it's totally supported by you for these 39 years. This generous response to the Lord's invitation to this gift of faith, but it requires our response. It's his initiative. It's the Holy Spirit prompting us, moving our hearts, opening our minds, making it easy for us to respond to the Lord. And so that's what the Lord is calling all of us today. Those who are believers, who maybe have grown a little bit lukewarm to respond more fully during this time to the Lord, and those maybe who do not yet know Christ, to know that too, the risen Lord, especially during this Easter season, is inviting you to respond to his invitation. In the gospel today, we had John chapter three. And there are three times that Jesus speaks in John's gospel of being lifted up, being lifted up. And the Greek word that is used there is hypso-o, hypso-o. And this word can mean, be understood in two different ways. It could mean, first, being physically lifted up. So Jesus was physically lifted up when he was nailed to the cross. He was lifted above the earth. But it can also mean to be exalted, to be glorified, lifted up in that way. And of course, both are true in the life of our Lord. Both of those are true. And there's three times in John's gospel that he refers to being lifted up. And each of them is important for us. Each one of those times is important for us to understand fully what the Lord is teaching us. So in today's gospel, John chapter three, he's saying to Nicodemus these words, that just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, in the book of Exodus, so must the son of man be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. So it was necessary for the Christ to endure his passion, to be lifted up on the cross, and to be ultimately exalted in heaven. Why? So that all who believe in him may have eternal life. So that's the first element of his being lifted up, that we might have, that you might have, that all who believe in him might have eternal life. The second time that he speaks of being lifted up is in John chapter eight. And this is where this controversy with the leaders is going on. And Jesus says these words, when you lift up the son of man, then you will realize that I am the name for God and that I do nothing on my own. So again, it's through this Paschal mystery, his passion, his being lifted up on the cross, his rising again from the dead, being exalted in glory, then you're going to realize that I am, that I am, that I am divine. He is the son of God, but he's also the son of man, true God and true man. When you lift up the son of man, then you will realize that I am. And then the third and final time that Jesus in John's gospel speaks of being lifted up is in John chapter 12. When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. So now the risen Lord, lifted up, exalted now in glory, and especially during these days before ascension, the, the celebration of the ascension, we think and experience, I think in a very particular way, the risen Lord being with us. And so he's drawing us to himself, drawing us to respond. If we're in darkness, if thorns and thistles have grown up to choke off the seed of his word in our lives, and we become lukewarm, he is persistent and patient and benevolent toward us. 
He continues to knock on that door of our hearts. And he's waiting for us to open that door to him. So the final point that I want to make today is how do we open that door? How do we open the door of our hearts to him? There's so many ways that we can respond to him every day. Multiple ways that we can open the door to Christ. When you tune into a program like this, not really a program, it's the offering of the sacrifice of the Holy Mass to which you're able to participate in a particular way through the media. It's a way in which you're opening the door and you're saying, Christ, come in. I want to have communion with you. And of course, we have the act of spiritual communion. I want to have communion with you and you with me. Whenever we pray, again, we're opening that door. Whenever we would read God's word or a good spiritual book that can help us to grow in our spiritual life, we're opening the door. Whenever we practice some act of charity for the love of God, we're opening the door. Whenever we receive a sacrament, all of these various ways that we can open the door. So during this time, and we pray that it will be shortened, this time of the crisis, and that things will become, please God, more safe and more relaxed so that we can live, go back to our lives, but not just as they were, but now different, different. Choosing that which is essential, choosing that which endures forever, choosing Christ who continues to knock on the door of our hearts, waiting for us to open them.